So I, I woke up this morning with a problem, and it wasn't a hangover. <laughs> um, the problem was is that after attending the conference and hearing everyone and meeting people, I finally knew what the question was. Someone yesterday referred to the idea that we need to know what the question is before we can provide the answer. I had never been happy with the talk I was supposed to give, and I suddenly really understood what the real question was. And the question was the following. It was, what of all the different things I know about the mind and brain, I'm trained as a psychologist, I work in neuroscience now, um, of all those different things I know, what would be the best thing to communicate to the people that are here, and the kinds of people that are here, and then also in terms of the theme of this particular TED conference? And I realized when I woke up this morning, not only did I wake up with this question, I literally had the presentation in front of my eyes. I knew what I wanted to say, and I wrote it on the back of an envelope, and I rewrote it on a couple cards. But th so that's what I'm going to tell you about. I'm going to tell you about this presentation. Um, and it's this talk. So this talk is about five kinds of power. And the first two kinds of power are simple. One of them is the power of surprise. So I surprised the organizer, organizers about an hour ago and said, I want to completely change my talk. And it, I think it worried them a little, but they were very good with it in the end. Um, the second one is the power of hindsight. I had the advantage, since I'm right near the end, of having hindsight and having heard all of you and being able to think about all the different things that people have talked about and we've talked about in the hallways as well. Now, the three other kinds of power are three lessons or examples from my own field of psychology, behavioral psychology, and they have a real lot to say, a great deal to say about power. And so I thought it'd be really important to communicate them to you. Okay, so the first... There we go. Um, the first one is about conformity. So there was a psychologist named Solomon Ash, and he was interested in how people conform to group pressure. And he would take people, just like any of you, and all of you may think, oh, I wouldn't be subject to these experiments, I wouldn't behave the same way subjects in these experiments behave, but you would be, okay? <laughs> That's one of the things we learned. He took people off the street, a single person, and he put them in a room with 10 other people, let's say, that were really stooges, they worked with Solomon Ash. And he showed them two cards, and on the cards were two lines. And one line was obviously bigger than the other line. Okay? It wasn't like a subtle experiment. One line was really much bigger than the other line. And he would go around the room, and the one subject was actually near the end of the room, and ask subjects, so this is a study on visual perception, I want you to just tell me which line is bigger. And they'd go to the first person, the first one would say that one, and they'd point to the smaller line. And then the next, sub, the next person in the room would say, what do you think? And he'd say that one, and they'd point to the smaller line. They go around the room like this. And if you've seen the videotapes, you can see the person who's the actual subject beginning to sweat, get more and more nervous, <laughs> uncomfortable situation. And most of the time, when you get to that person, what happens? They point to the smaller line and say it's bigger. Okay? So it's a very simple lesson about the pressure of conformity and how all of you, and many of you are managers or leaders, in thinking about how conformity affects our behavior and how even when we think and we see with our own eyes that something is inconsistent with what everyone else is saying, we respond with the group. So that's story number one. Okay, story number two, this is my favorite of the three. It's about groups and the power of groups and labels that are put on groups. So there's a researcher at Stanford named Phil Zimbardo, and he was interested in this group interaction behavior. And he decided to run an experiment, this is back in the 60s in Stanford, so this is a group of fairly liberal students as well, pretty relaxed students. He recruited a large number of students, I think it was about 20 students, to be involved in a week-long experiment. And he brought these students in, and he said, half of you are going to be prisoners, and half of you are going to be jailers. And he gave them things that were sort of like uniforms for the jailers, the prisoners got things that were more like prisoner uniforms, and he turned the, building, the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building into a prison and used a bunch of labs there, and he created an environment where it was literally like a prison, that the prisoners sort of sat around all day, they got a little bit of time to walk around the yard, and the jailers were responsible for doing all the things that jailers would normally do. Okay, as this experiment went on, over the course of the week, remember these are all Stanford undergraduates, and they were arbitrarily put in one of the two groups. As the experiment went on, what happens? Well, the jailers start to abuse, both verbally and physically, the prisoners. Okay, the prisoners get more and more unhappy. They're feeling oppressed, they're feeling like they're, they're being abused. Some of them are becoming very docile because of this. Okay, there's actual physical interactions where there, people are somewhat hurting each other. Now this all begins to come to a head, and now Phil, of course, is the experimenter. He's supposed to know better and understand, you know, this is still an experiment, I'm studying this group behavior. 
so one day, I think it was a weekend day, a jailbreak occurs. They call up Phil, the jailers, in panic because of this jailbreak. Some of the prisoners had broken out of the basement of the Stanford Psychology Building. Okay. Phil, and this part, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but Gordon Bauer, his colleague, told me this story. Um, comes running down the hallway. Someone said it was in his bathrobe. I don't know if that's true or not. But he comes running down the hallway, and Gordon stops him and says, Phil, what's wrong? And Phil says, there's been a jailbreak. I have to go stop the jailbreak. And Gordon says, Phil, pulls him over and says, Phil, I think you need to stop the experiment. <laughs> and apparently Phil stepped back and went, oh, my goodness, I don't, I, you know. So that's story number two. And again, it's a story about power and how the labels we put on groups and the mere creation of a group creates a kind of power structure. And all of us do that, of course, in our organizations. And sometimes we imbue one group with more power than another group. And naturally, these groups then have these asymmetries of power behave in ways because of the definitions we've given them. OK, so that's story number two. Now, the last story is about authority. And it's in some ways the most um, scary of the three stories. And th this story is about a researcher named Stanley Milgram. And he was interested in how people responded to authority, particularly in light of what had happened in Nazi Germany in World War II. And again, he took normal individuals from the street or from the college campuses, people that, like you and I, that think, well, we wouldn't behave in particularly unusual ways. Um, and he brought them into the lab. And he had a dupe there again, a stooge. And that stooge was someone who worked with Milgram. And he introduces the stooge to um, the uh, um, person brought in who's a subject. And he said to them, OK, one of you is going to be training the other person. And the way we're going to train you is with electric shock. And he actually has the subject feel the shock, which is very mild to get them to believe there's a real electric shock. And he takes the stooge and he puts them in the room and straps them down very elaborately. And then, and then he takes the um, um, experiment, the, the experimenter stooge, and he, bring, I'm sorry, he brings the subject into the other room and says, here's the control for the um, shocking device. So you've now got the stooge in the one room being shocked. You've got the person who's the subject actually controlling it. Okay, there is no real electric shock in this experiment, actually. Okay, but the subject doesn't know that. And then Milgram, or one of the other people working in his lab, is wearing a light, white lab coat, trying to express some kind of authority, starts asking questions, and the stooge keeps getting them wrong. And every time the stooge gets one wrong, Milgram has the subject apply a shock to the um, stooge. The shocks keep getting larger and larger. There's a knob with these numbers, and they turn the knob up. And at some point, the, the student starts saying things like, please don't shock me, it really hurts. Please stop, I'll try and answer the questions, but they're really hard. And Milgram says, you must continue the experiment. Okay? Um, they turn the knob up even more, and um, the subject is now you know, very nervous, but they're continuing to do it. Milgram says, you must continue the experiment. The student is now screaming in agony when the shocks are applied. Screaming in agony, please stop, please stop. Shock keeps getting um, stronger and stronger. In the end, in some of the cases, people were willing to shock people all to the point of putative death. There was no answer to the question when it's asked. Okay? These are undergraduates and people off the street, like you and I. Okay? So it's an example of how just the, basically the um, illusion of authority, the idea that you're wearing a lab coat and you're the experimenter and there's a subject there and you're being told that you have to continue this experiment is sufficient to create that and to get people to do things you don't think they would ever do. Okay, so what can we learn from all of this? Well, I thought it was a really important thing to communicate to all of you because it's one of the great lessons of psychology over probably the last hundred years are these experiments. They fundamentally changed the way we think about human behavior and the way we study human behavior in academia. It's really changed a lot of the way People study all sorts of problems because of these experiments, and we think about the way people behave towards one another. So it's a very important point, and I really hope, as a lesson to all of you, that it motivates all of you to think about how you apply these kinds of principles about conformity, about groups, and authority in your own professions and your own lives. Thank you. Thank you.